is why this channel exists. That is why my restaurant exists. That is why I'm doing the work that I'm doing is because I want to push and change the way that our world does that. Because it's not totally changed yet, you get to decide how and when and where you disclose disability and how you talk about it. Hi, my name is Katherine Hubert. This is my business, Chez Jeunesse, where I am the restaurant owner, chef, and disability integration coach. More on all of that later. Hey, everybody. Welcome back. It's been a couple weeks since I've been on here, and I've honestly really missed it. It's felt a little bit weird to have that absence, but... I was traveling, I was sick, there were some other things that came up that kind of held me back from being able to plan and film the content. So thanks for your patience with the break. I'm so excited to be here today. We are going to be talking about when to use the term disability versus when to use the term neurodivergent or neurodiverse. You probably hear a lot of words tossed around culturally around both disability and neurodiversity. We're going to stick to those two terms today because as a general rule of them, we want to avoid disability euphemisms, which if you're unfamiliar with what those are, they're probably most of all the other terms that you're thinking of. And we have a video here that you can check out that outlines what those euphemisms are and why we discourage the use of them. But a lot of times people are unsure of the difference between disability versus neurodiversity. You probably have heard an increase in neurodiversity or neurodivergence being used in the past several years and have had maybe some questions about exactly what that means and whether or not those two terms are interchangeable. Should we replace disability with neurodivergent? So we're going to get into all of that today. I am filming in my house today on a break between things at work and so you may see little Avery make an appearance. She may stay like that in her frog dog position during the course of this video, but if not, hopefully you'll get to see her face too. So let's break it down. Disability, neurodiversity, both terms are good terms to use. Both are applicable. They do mean slightly different things and they are used in slightly different contexts. So we're going to break all of that down. Disability, that's where we're going to start. There's lots of different definitions available. If you Google it, if you ask people for their definition, you're going to get a variety of responses. The definition that I use and that we use at my business, Chez Jeunesse, comes from a book called Demystifying Disability. The author, Emily Ledo, is disabled and the definition that she uses is a state of being, a natural part of the human experience. I love that definition for a lot of different reasons. One, it does leave things fairly broad, but it also does it envelops disability into our human experience instead of, instead of separating it from, which oftentimes happens through bias in our culture. So I like the way that it's constructed. I like the neutral language of the definition. There's no positivity or negativity attached to disability. It just is what it is. Again, this is one definition. There could be a lot of different definitions. And I think that part of the reason behind that is because Disability is part of being human and it's hard to sum up exactly exactly what it means to be human because there's so much that falls underneath that umbrella. There's so many different layers and elements and facets to being a person. And so there's a lot of different elements and layers and facets to being a person with a disability as well. That being said, disability is a medical and a legal classification. That is how that term is used. It is protected under the Americans with Disabilities Act. People with disabilities are protected under the Americans with Disabilities Act or the ADA. And so I feel like it's also important to recognize and to acknowledge what the ADA's definition of disability is, because that's important in terms of medical and legal protection. So the ADA defines disability as a person with a disability is someone who has a physical or mental impairment that substantially limits one or more major life activities, has a history or record of such impairment such as cancer that is in remission, or is perceived by others as having such an impairment such as a person who has scars from a severe burn. If a person falls into any of these categories, the ADA protects them because the ADA is a law and a not a benefit program. You do not need to apply for coverage. The first thing I'll say about that is that some of those definitions feel a little bit vague, impairment or substantially also perceived and major life function. All of those things, I think, 
cover a lot of things and aren't explicit. There's a level of vagueness that is rolled into those definitions. I think that's a good thing. I think it's a good thing because like we talked about earlier, disability is going to show up differently in each person because each person is different. And because each person is different, disability is going to look slightly different for each person. So it's helpful to know that that substantially a substantial impact that's going to vary a little bit from person to person. A major life function may vary a little bit from person to person. I like that this umbrella is set big because the intent behind that is a broader level of protection for people with disabilities. Of course, we know that that isn't the way that things always happen in our world. There's still a lot of discrimination and bias and injustice that happens in our world towards people with disabilities. That is illegal. It's against it's against American law. That doesn't necessarily stop it from happening, which is really sad and unfortunate and frustrating and infuriating. But I do want to say that the way that that law is set up does, I think, provide at its best a broad level of protection for all disabilities. That's our corner. That's our disability corner for the today. For the today. For today. Moving on to neurodiversity and neurodivergence. I'm saying both of those terms because they're used kind of how you would say disability versus disabled, neurodiversity versus neurodivergent. There's a different identity that gets attached there. Neurodiversity is a social concept, so it is not a medical and legal term the way that disability is. It is a social concept and term that developed in the 1990s. So historically, it hasn't been around all of that long, which is probably why you've heard an influx over the past several years of that term. It's been gaining momentum, which is a good thing. I think it's been really helpful culturally, helped a lot of people be able to identify and understand themselves better and also have a sense of community. It was a term coined by a sociologist named Judy Singer. The general construct or foundation was to promote an idea of celebration and understanding around all brains, to acknowledge that all brains are different, they're all unique, there's not any brain that's exactly the same to another brain, and it the concept of neurodiversity encourages and challenges us to get curious and to learn more about not only our own brains, but brains that are different from ours as well. There's a lot of positivity to that. I I really like the concept of neurodiversity as a whole. I think it's a great social and educational tool for us to use. And I think there's still a lot of room for us to grow in the area and understanding of our brains just on a lay person level, not on a clinical level, not as a doctor, not as a psychologist, like just as as a person understanding more about my brain, understanding more about brains around me. There's a little bit, I think, of... I guess I should say my only hesitation with neurodiversity is that it's currently still used to talk about brains that seem different. So it it kind of promotes, which was not the initial intent, but I think it's oftentimes still used as though there's a standard or there's a norm for a human brain. And then people who identify as being neurodiverse identify as having a brain that's outside of that norm. I'm a fan in general of removing norm and normal from our language when it comes to talking about humans. We don't have normal humans and abnormal humans or typical humans and atypical humans, even though that kind of polarization is often done within the non-disability versus disability communities and worlds. So if we're eliminating that, then I think that changes somewhat of the way that neurodiversity and neurodivergence is currently used and talked about. So that's important to point out. I also will point out that there's crossover between disability and neurodiversity. While disability needs to be the classification that is present in order for medical and legal rights to be protected, a lot of neurodivergence is going to fall under the ADA. So those two things are not mutually exclusive. There definitely can be crossover, but there's not always someone may decide for themselves without having any diagnosis that they identify as being neurodiverse. That's totally within their right to do that, but it does make protection a little bit more complicated. 
They're also, when we're talking about disability versus neurodiversity, neurodiversity is talking all about the brain, hence the neuro aspect of it, whereas disability is going to cover all areas of disability, so the brain can be included in that, but so is our bodies. So are our bodies. (laughs) Someone who is blind would fall into a category of disability instead of neurodivergence whereas someone who has ADHD would more likely fall into a category of neurodiversity instead of disability. Again, those things don't have to be mutually exclusive. There are disabilities and neurodivergence that you know that cross over and they're going to be in both camps, but there are some that make sense in one more than the other, especially if the disability doesn't have anything to do with the brain. So what do we do with all that information? Why am I telling you this in the first place? One, because language really does matter. The words that we use, the meaning that's behind them, and the tone that we're using all impact the way that someone feels about what we're communicating. I think that's just important, an important piece of communication in general, but especially when we're talking about a marginalized group that has often times been pushed to the fringes or left out or talked about in negative ways historically. And so it's not just enough to change a word. We also want to talk about the meaning. We want to talk about the history. We want to understand where things are coming from so that as we continue to grow and evolve in our language and our understanding, we are also changing the way that we're thinking about something, not just the way we're talking about something, but the way that we're actually thinking and feeling about it too. All of that being said, both disability, both neurodiversity are neutral, acceptable, reasonable, appropriate, and kind ways to talk about disability and neurodivergence. Those terms are there for a reason. We don't need to talk around them. We don't need to make up other terms. They are great and fine just the way that they are because both disability and neurodiversity are a natural part of the human experience and not something to be ashamed of and not something to place shame on, not something to talk about in negative terms because there's nothing wrong with it. That being said, if you're watching this video, you're probably falling into either the category of you are a disabled human or you are a non-disabled human. So if you're a disabled human, you get to talk about your disability however you want to or not at all. That's up to you. That's your own right. That's your own freedom that you get to exercise. You can decide if disability or neurodiversity fits more with how you feel about yourself and whether or not or if and when those terms actually benefit you. And that may change some based on the scenario or based on the setting. And hopefully as we continue to grow and evolve as a world and as a culture we get to a point where there's not the stigma and the stereotype that's attached to either one of those things there's not the same weight or meaning that's attached to those people get to decide that for themselves instead of having that placed on them by culture and society but because we're not quite there yet although that is why this channel exists that is why my restaurant exists that is why i'm doing the work that i'm doing is because i want to push and change the way that our world does that Because it's not totally changed yet, you get to decide how and when and where you disclose disability and how you talk about it. If you are a non-disabled person watching this video, then know that you can use either term The best rule of thumb is that you use the term that a person who identifies as being neurodivergent or having a disability prefers. If they've disclosed to you either of those things, that's an open door for you to ask some follow-up questions of, do you like to talk about it? How do you like to talk about it? So that you can be respectful and kind and communicate in ways that they feel respected in. Again, it's helpful to know the distinction of disability being medical and legal and also covering all disabilities and neurodiversity being a social concept and talking specifically about the brain. From there, there's room to use both. That's it for today. If you have questions, thoughts, please drop them below. Anytime I do one of these videos, I feel like there are people who watch them who are able to take something that I've said and expand on it and grow it. I only get you for a short period of time and these are very nuanced and complex subjects that we're talking about. And so there is a lot more that we could cover. I wanted to give you some snapshots today. If you want to continue the conversation, I would love to keep talking with you in the comments below. Don't forget to subscribe to our channel. We are excited to see it growing and so happy to have you part of this little community. And I will catch you next week. Shazen S teammates and guests, your keyword this week in honor of all the artwork in my house is Paris. 
Welcome to Chez Jeunesse, the place of new beginnings. My name is Catherine Hubert, and I founded and own a French-inspired cafe where, as a team, we are on a mission to change the way that our world understands neurodiversity and employs humans with disabilities. Our restaurant was born and is based in Greensboro, North Carolina, and that's where we practice and teach our mission and model. This is our channel where we dive in deep to who we are, what we do, and why we do it. Our hope is that this content is empowering to disabled and non-disabled humans alike, and that no matter what perspective you are coming from, employer, employee, parent, friend, or Shazeness fan, you feel welcomed, you learn something new, and you walk away with a deeper appreciation and understanding of humanity.